Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for not having something better to do tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be in your presence and to talk to you about this subject that I've spent a little bit of time wading through. Um, that photograph there is a, a photograph of the book, and I'm not here to sell the book, uh, but I did write the book as a vehicle to get some of these ideas out there. The title of the book is Tarnished Toxic Leadership in the U.S. Military. You do not have to buy it, although it is available in both Kindle and Nook versions. <laughs> should you wish to do so at Amazon.com. But no, I'm really not here to sell the book, buy the book. I'm really not here to sell the book. Uh, but um, it was published in, uh, in September, and so what I'm going to talk to you are some of the ideas that are in the book and that were the part of four journal articles before that. And although the book focuses on a particular context, the military context, because that was the context that I had the most access to when I was doing data collection, I will tell you that there is nothing about the dynamic of toxic leadership that is limited to any one environment. As a matter of fact, we don't know if toxic leadership is higher in one sector versus another. I do have some anecdotal data, though. I usually ask audiences, and I will ask you this question as well, how many of you have left a job or seriously considered leaving a job because of how you were treated by a supervisor? Hold it. Okay, well, go ahead. Go ahead. While we're at it, just go ahead. Throw up your hands if you have left a job or seriously considered leaving a job because of the way you're treated by supervisor. Now look around, everybody. Look around. What, what do you think that is? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the fundamental question is, can't we do better than that? Can't we? Uh, and the problem with leadership is that it is frequently portrayed in a universally positive way. Leadership is good, right? Leadership is good. Leadership is good. Leadership is good. That's the mantra. So leadership is nothing more than a psychosocial construct. It's a way we make sense of certain activities and certain behaviors. And, but there may be something about it that, is, uh, that, that we are genetically predisposed to. We are, after all, primates, are we not? Sophisticated primates, perhaps, but nonetheless, we are primates. So if you were to look at a gorilla troop, you would see that every gorilla troop has a silverback male. And the silverback male looks different than the other gorillas. Bigger grows this big silver mane, which is why they call them silverbacks. And the, and the troop follows the silverback uh, male because the good, he's good at typically finding food. So they follow and they cue all of their actions and their social interactions off of the silverback male. And then when the silverback male is displaced, becomes ill, gets old, or whatever, something very interesting happens. He fades. A new silverback male comes up, challenges for authority over the troop, takes its place, grows the big silver mane. The old gorilla loses his stature, kind of shrinks in size, and dies, and dies. Goes off into the woods and, and dies because he's been replaced. Maybe there is something about human beings that cause us to look for the leader. Leader's just a psychological construct, right? Uh, how much power does one person really have? Um, I think I find these things interesting. So I thank you for being here this evening because there's nothing I'd rather do than be locked in a room full of people that are interested in leadership. So if we can just pretend that we're all interested in leadership for the next hour or so, we're getting along just great. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk to you about some ideas, some concepts relating to this notion. Then we're going to have some interaction, and I'm going to ask for questions. We're going to have a Q&A. So I would love for you to be thinking of hard questions. Think of some good questions, because I can't approach all of the aspects of this topic that I would like to talk to you about in the amount of time that we have to, available, so I'll need some interaction from you. All right, so here's the topic. Essentially, I'm interested in an interaction between three variables. Leadership style. What's leadership style? Leadership style is your interaction as a leader, your behavior over time, the pattern of your behavior over time, as perceived by the targets of influence. Okay, so you don't get to tell me what your leadership style is because you can only tell me your intentions. But leadership style is perceived by the targets of influence, the followers, if you will, is what I'm interested in. Leadership style. What's your style? Have you ever thought about that? What's your leadership style? What adjectives do people that you attempt to influence use when they're talking about you? Is it words like sincere, hard-driving, 
I, I, you can probably come up with some nasty adjectives too. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But nonetheless, people are judging you right now that are within the sphere of influence. So think about the pattern of behavior manifested over time as perceived by the targets of influence, leadership style. Organizational climate, how it feels around here. Okay, if you will, how it feels around. Not, not to be confused with organizational culture. Organizational culture is deep, but usually exists below the surface. It's learned over time, it's passed from group to group over time, generation to generation, if you will. It can be very enduring and hard to change. Organizational climate is more surface level and changes rather quickly. So let me give you an example of organizational climate. How many of you played sports? All right, okay, all right. Um, are all 27 elite athletes, Olympic athletes in this room right now? That's, no, okay, because I know we have 27 at the university. Um, climate, you're preparing for the big game, okay? You've won all of your games all season, and you're on the bus, and you're riding to the big game. You know how that feels? You get a lot of anxiety, a lot of, a lot of anticipation, uh, and, and you go, and you play the big game, and you lose. How does that bus ride feel on the way home? Okay, that's climate. <laughs> that's climate. Climate changes. How does it feel around here, right? From one place to another. And then the third part is uh, the sine qua non of all organizations, and that's effectiveness. I mean, the reason we assemble as a group are to accomplish things. So um, to, what is the degree to which we are effective? And there are a lot of different definitions of effectiveness. So that's the interaction I'm interested in. And the question is, you know, what style got to do with it? Which is a ripoff of a pretty good Ike and Tina Turner song, actually. Right? What's love got to do with it? What style got to do with it? That's the question. So here's the operational problem. In any organization, when it comes to people who are on positions of authority, let's call them leadership positions, they sit on a spectrum. At one of the end of the spectrum is wonderful, inspiring, motivating, just people that you love to go to work for. You get out of bed in the morning, you're just excited because you can go to work for them. They're at this end of the spectrum, and there's not that many of them that are that off the hook good, right? Most of us are right here in the middle of this theoretical, hypothetical, normal distribution, okay? We know no organization is actually normal. I gave this presentation at the Air Force Academy, and I had a cadet that was taking statistics come up to me and want to argue about the level of skew and, the, and I said, you're missing the point, son. The point is that there are a few over here, and there are a few, that's right, that's right. And there are a few over here. Uh, most of us are pretty good, and depending upon your organization, I'd say you know, the leadership influence behavior is typically more good than it is bad, okay, in a lot of places, certainly the places that I've been. In 27 years in the Army, I experienced far more outstanding leadership than I did bad leadership, which made those on this end of the spectrum stand out that much more starkly by example. And there are always a few, right? There's a few at this end of the spectrum, and they are awful. They are belittling. They are demotivating, and they are destructive because the cumulative impact of their interpersonal actions have a negative impact on the organization. So that's it in a nutshell. In any organization, we're going to find some that are over here, and some that are over here. And the question I typically have to ask is, is that okay? And how much bad is acceptable? There, statistically, there'll always be a bottom third, right? But how bad does the bottom third have to be before there's some sort of an organizational intervention to deal with it? That's the question. So, I'm gonna to talk to you about Reed's 4F affiliation theory, which is a theory about why we choose to affiliate with the organizations that we do. Why do you choose to be here versus someplace else? Why do you choose to do what it is that you do where you do it? Why do you worship at the house of worship that you do if you do? What clubs do you affiliate with when you have a choice and you volunteer to affiliate? Um, that's the kind of affiliation I'm talking about. So it's Reed's theory because I made this stuff up. And when you make stuff up in the academic game, you get to put your name on it and it's a big deal leads to tenure, it's a good thing, okay? <laughs> so it's Reed's theory. And it's the 4F theory because, well, that will become apparent. So the first F in Reed's 4F theory is funds. 
which is everything tangible, everything economic. It's the way in modern society that we reach Maslow's lowest level, right? Which are, you know, uh, security needs and, and survival needs. So the way we do that in modern society is we earn a paycheck and we pay for it. So funds are very important. It's not the only motivator though. It's, not, it's insufficient to explain a lot of human behavior. But funds are important. And if, if you're working in a position and someone else is going to come along and say, hey, George, I want you to do the same thing you're doing at UCCS, but I want to pay you a whole lot more money, it would be economically irrational for me not to consider it. Now, I might not take the job, but I'll look. And most of us in this room would do the same thing. You would look because we're economically rational individuals. But economics can be spelled a lot of different ways. The second F is fun. And this is one we don't talk about enough but there is a social wage associated with doing something that you enjoy doing, doing something that you have a good time with. And I don't, I don't know what it is that makes you happy, but sometimes you're willing to stay in a job if you're having fun, even if someone else is willing to pay you more money. I mean, there are people that are doing extraordinary things for very little money under very adverse uh, circumstances but they continue to do it. Why, why do they do that? Well, there's something about having a good time. Think about the job that you enjoyed the most. You probably laughed a lot, didn't you? Fair amount of humor. There's something about fun. I think we undervalue fun. I think it's a very important value. And are, how many of you in the audience are, are law enforcement officials? Any, any law enforcement guys out there? I know there's a couple. I'd like to talk to law enforcement organizations 27 years as a military policeman. And when I start talking to them about fun, I get a lot of negative feedback. They push back. They're like, what are you doing? Denigrating what we do? It's not fun. It's not a joking matter. It's serious. It's lives and livelihoods. And don't talk to me about fun. And I say, OK, fine. Let's talk about high speed chases, shall we? All right, ripping up the interstate 120 miles an hour, lights and siren, adrenaline flowing through your body. The stop sticks come out. The car goes sideways, spins in the meeting and stops. You let loose the dog. The dog eats him for a while. You come up, you hit him with the OC spray. You get him down, you handcuff him, you get up, you walk back to your squad car, and it's high fives all around with your buddies. You want to tell me that's not a good time? <laughs> that's right. Well, okay, George, I got you there. That, that part's kind of fun. No, celebrate it. Celebrate it. it. Even though it's serious business, having a good time is okay. And I think as supervisors, we have, sometimes have to understand that it's okay and even appropriate to encourage people to enjoy what they do. Let them have a good time. I mean, a lot of professions get to do a lot of interesting things. Celebrate that. The third F is fellowship. And by fellowship, I mean social cohesion. Social cohesion. It's the bond with the people that you work with. It's caring about the people that you're with, the sense of team, the sense of camaraderie. Uh, that's important and it drives some extraordinary behaviors. I'll give you an example here in just a second. The final F is a feeling that you're part of something that's bigger than self, that you're making a difference. We are, we are homo sapiens. We, are, uh, we may be sophisticated primates, but it's, it's not enough just for us to, to be born, to uh, consume, defecate, procreate, and die. We're not houseflies, right? We have, we have senses of purpose and meaning, and that's important to most human beings. We want to leave a legacy. We want to accomplish something, something uh, that is enduring, perhaps even beyond our time on this earth. I think that's a fundamental human drive. Now, only one of these four Fs are tangible. That's funds. And for many of you, funds are outside of your control, right? But what I'm asking you, what I'm suggesting is, if you're not making any money, you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not having any fun, you don't like the people that you work with or for, and you not as f feel as though you're not making any difference, what's the only rational thing to do? Yeah, just about anything else, right? Time to move on. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not rational to stay in an organization where all four Fs are in the negative. Well. What if you have a deficit in one? Well, my suggestion is, if you're a steward of that organization, then you better be working on the other three. You better be working on the things that you can have impact on. And here's the other thing. No two people come at this formula with exactly the same perspective. So here I am. Most of my life I was a soldier. Now I'm an academic. 
obviously funds are not a significant part of my formula, right? It's what I do and who I do it with has always kind of turned my crank. But I have a brother-in-law who is the chief information officer for a Fortune 50 company. And he is in a job where he makes a lot of money. I will go so far as to say he makes an obscene amount of money. I mean, really offensive levels of money. I'm talking the Park Avenue apartment, the driver that picks him up every day and takes him to work the whole nine yards, okay? He's made it in terms of the first F. But it's a miserable, stinking job. I'll tell you that because, I mean, one of, one of the things about his job is his company requires uh, his network to be up and running 100% all the time, 24 hours a day, 100% reliability, no, no outages. If he gets a little uh, text on his smartphone every 15 minutes and that message says system okay, basically. It says that the system's operating as it should be. If he ever doesn't get that message, he's out of a job, fired. 100% reliability is the standard, no exceptions. Not his fault, doesn't matter if it goes to, imagine waking up at 2.30 in the morning saying, oh my God, I didn't get the, I didn't get the message. And that would end all of those zeros that he enjoys so much behind his salary, okay? Not a good time. And oh, by the way, thinks his bosses are, are not very bright and um, that his subordinates are all contriving to screw things up so he loses all those dollars so he doesn't get that. So it's a high stress, not a lot of fun sort of an organization, not a lot of fellowship and camaraderie in it. And their product, I, I hesitate to say too much about it, but I will simply say that there is no item that they sell in their stores that is worth more than $10. I'm motivated to get up and go out of bed and, and do that, right? But did I mention that he makes a boatload of money? And for him, that's okay. It wouldn't work for me. I'm just telling you right now, it wouldn't work for me, but it works for him. So no two people are exactly the same on how they fall out on these four Fs. But if you care about your organization, you have a deficit, you ought to be thinking about the others and what you can do about that. Now, let me tell you about this guy. This is Ross McGinnis. Has anybody here heard of Ross McGinnis? That's a shame. We, there's, there's a lot of people we do hear about every day that we're not of the same level of import that Ross McGinnis is. And I'll, I'll warn you up front, it's a soldier story, and it's a sad story. Um, that picture was taken three days before he was killed in Iraq. It's that kind of a story, so I'll just warn you up front. But how he died is important to our point, okay? That's the reason I'm telling it to you. So Ross McGinnis was from a small town near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He didn't do that well in school. Uh, he was a mischievous lad, got in a fair amount of trouble. His parents really weren't sure if he was going to be an asset to society or a detriment to society. They really weren't sure. He did, he went into the armed forces, that's his induction photo there on the right, and uh, he was on patrol in Iraq, and uh, somebody threw a grenade, an insurgent threw a grenade. The grenade actually hit McGinnis in the chest and then fell into the vehicle. Now at that point, he had a fateful choice to make. Do I go after the grenade or do I jump out of the vehicle? Jump out of the vehicle to almost assured safety, go after gr the grenade to almost assured destruction. It's not something that's trained. He made the decision to go after the grenade because there were three other people in the vehicle, including his supervisor, his sergeant, who was driving the vehicle. He said, grenade, it's in the truck. And he chased it to the back of the vehicle his sergeant turned in time to see McGinnis clutch the grenade to his chest. The grenade went off. McGinnis was killed instantly, but all three other people in that vehicle are alive and walking in the face of this earth today as a result of his decision. So the question I have to ask is, why? Why did he do it? Did he do it for funds? Show hands. No, there's no amount of money, right? There's no amount of money. Uh, fun, not fun, but I will tell you, he was funny. And what people in his unit said about him was that he was, uh, he had a great sense of humor and he was able to make people laugh. So they really liked him in the unit because he could find humor in the most bizarre situation. And, and that was considered a gift. Um, how about fellowship? Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, we got a winner. We got a winner. Um, and it, it's, so long as we've been studying the behavior of uh, Soldiers in battle, we know that they do what they do because of the person to the right and their left, not because of any of these other, other uh, tangibles or intangibles. And a feeling, 
well, you know, motherhood and apple pie may get you to the recruiting office, but I don't think it gets you to dive on a grenade, right? I really think fellowship is probably the, the chief explanatory factor in that little story. Now, we know as much as we do about this because McGinnis received the Medal of Honor. And when you do that, they document your case very thoroughly. There is no question by the time that the White House ceremony takes place. And at ceremonies at the White House, when his parents accepted the Medal of Honor on his behalf, they said, our son was average. Our son was average. Isn't that amazing? Uh, he wasn't average that day. We'll, we'll put it that way. And as a result, he's forever inscribed in the annals of valor, at least as this nation keeps it. The and you can go online. You can go online to the Medal of Honor website and check out his story and see if I said anything inaccurate. It's all very well documented. All right, so here's the question that I wrestle with sometimes. Does leadership style matter? The, the literature is kind of mixed. So, I mean, if you're... if if you're asking me, uh, do people have to be happy in order to do a good job, I will say obviously not, right? Because if you're a professional, okay, you're a real pro, and you care about what you do, and you get a bad boss, does that mean you're going to stop doing what you do? Of course not. You're going to go over, through, around, under. You're going to get the job done anyway because you care, because you're a professional, and that's what professionals do right? So maybe leadership style doesn't matter. Maybe people don't have to be happy or, or have high morale. Especially if we measure organizational effectiveness in short-term increments, right? For example, this quarter. If you're measuring effectiveness quarter to quarter to quarter, there's no need to look at the long-term health and welfare of the people in your organization, is there? If you're only as good as your next mission or your last mission, people don't have to be happy. Where, but where do we step back and ask that broader question? What is the impact of this on our people? Um, is there a cost that's paid for leaders with a destructive style? So this is where we get to have some interaction because a lot of you have had this experience. So what is the downside? What is the impact a bad impact of working for a destructive leader, a person with a destructive leadership style. Any thoughts? What, what bad happens? Sure. So it's high turnover could be a negative impact. And I, and I will tell you, I'm glad you started with that because this is a complicated factor. When we do the research, uh, what we found is that if, uh, and I'm going to talk about military populations now specifically, there's a significant difference between senior officers and junior enlisted people when it comes to this, right? So if you've got more than 10 years in the military and the military is a 20 year or nothing retirement process, yeah, they'll experience bad leadership, but they don't leave. And, and even if they're eligible to leave, they don't necessarily leave. And even if that's not the case, if you're in, a, in, a, in an industry where you can come and go as you please, people don't necessarily leave when they have a bad boss because many times there's not a better option. They got to put bread on the table. So if, if it's a raging economy and people, that also impacts it. So it's complicated. I want to say that talent flees toxicity. But what I have found is that's not always the case. It depends on how long and how invested you are in the profession and in the organization. So I did some research with senior military officers and I was surprised to find that they experience toxic leadership at a pretty high rate, but they don't leave. They're in. They, it has no impact no impact on inclination to remain in service. So I said, gee, that's interesting. Let's go repeat this with people that have less than 10 years. Oh, they're out of here. They are out. They are one, maybe two bad bosses away from a different line of work. And there is a significant statistical relationship with them. So it's complicated. Other negative impacts. Stifles innovation. It stifles innovation. And, and one of the reasons it's stifling is when you're working for a blowtorch, you don't want to have that focused on you. So there's a tendency not to take a risk. And, and if you're going to experiment, 75% of experiments fail. Isn't that a statistic? So if you're going to experiment, you can't tolerate failure if you're working for a blowtorch. So you tend not to take the risk, to dampen creativity, not get engaged. Excellent. Insert in the back there. Excellent, excellent. That's why I started with the 4S, because all of those are negatively impacted 
by uh, those with a bad boss, even funds. Uh, obviously, whether you have a good boss or bad boss doesn't depend on how you get paid, but it does affect your impression about whether what you're getting paid is sufficient. So if you're working for a bad boss, your, your natural sentiment is they're not paying me enough to put up with this, right? No matter what you get paid. So what it really impacts is satisfaction. No matter how many ways we've tried to measure satisfaction, there's always a negative relationship. So satisfaction with relationships with superiors, you would expect to be bad, to be, to be negatively correlated, right? Toxic leadership goes up, satisfaction goes down. All right, what about relationship with subordinates? Why should the relationship with your subordinates suffer if you have a bad boss? Well, it does. It does. We, 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 we calculated it, okay? There's a, and how about relationship with peers? Those get eroded too. So I can come up with a lot of explanations why that shouldn't be the case, but at least the research we've done to date indicates uh, a strong, significant anyway, negative correlation. Uh, so what are some of the other impacts? We talk about fun, fellowship, feeling. You know, it's hard to be, to, to think about all the good you're doing to society in this difficult job when you're being abused by your boss. When you have a bully boss, it's just, it's just hard to come to work and, and remind yourself that you're doing good for, for mankind. Um, organizational citizenship behavior is an interesting idea from the uh, decision sciences, from the managerial sciences specifically, where the idea is that organizational citizenship behavior is when you do more than that which is required of you voluntarily. So my example is you're walking across campus and you look over 20 feet off to the side there's uh, the sidewalk there and there's some litter. There's some trash that somebody has dropped. Now, nobody is looking at you. There's no requirement to do so. Do you look at the trash, shrug your shoulders and keep walking? Or do you go 20 feet out of your way, pick it up and throw it in the trash can because you have pride in your campus? Okay, what do you, what do you, what do, you do? Uh, well, here's what we know. If you're working for a toxic boss, people don't go pick up the trash. Okay? They do what they must do. They will comply because it hurts too much not to, but they are not as committed. They won't go the extra mile and do more than what they're required to do. Why? Because what if you don't do it the way the boss wants it done? It's going to hurt too bad. right? So it's dampened. Organizational citizenship behavior goes down. Satisfaction, no matter how we've been able to measure it. And cynicism. One of my uh, dissertation students, Jimmy Dobbs, did research at the Air Force Academy, and he found that there's various different types of cynicism, individual cynicism, organizational cynicism. But when you have a toxic boss, you tend to blame the organization for it. In other words, subordinates don't see it as an individual problem. They see it as an organizational problem. So what they found with cadets at the Air Force Academy, who can be a pretty cynical bunch, I'll tell you that up front, um, they kind of see themselves as against the institution until they graduate, and then they love the institution. But they really hate the institution while they're there. Uh, many of them do. And if they have a bad TAC officer, they tend to be very cynical. Cynicism, unlike skepticism, is a, is a problem. Skepticism is not a problem. I want everybody in this room to be a skeptic. A skeptic questions everything. And that's good. That's what we want. That's critical thinking. Skeptics don't get suckered. Okay? They're always looking for the rabbit under the hat. Uh, but, but cynics, on the other hand, they see a malevolent motivation and just about anything that happens. So they are, they are jaundiced against the organization. So I'm walking down the hallway, my supervisor is walking the other, and she turns to me and says, George, that was a great presentation Tuesday, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, here it comes, here it comes, the shoe's going to fall, she's buttering me up for something bad, here it comes. That is the thought process of a cynic, not a skeptic. And cynicism has a lot of negative ramifications. But when cadets experience... Uh, uh, cynicism, uh, it wasn't, oh, my TAC officer is bad. Their perception was the Air Force sucks. Okay? That's how that gets translated. Of course, it's an organizational problem. They put this person in charge of me who's treating me badly. They must know how bad he or she is, and therefore they're complicit in the toxicity. So it gets translated to a higher level of analysis. All right, retention. We talked about retention. Good. Now, there's some other impact. This is uh, research that was published in Harvard Business Review a couple of years back, Porath and Pearson, 
And look at these, look at these numbers. Look at these productivity impacts. 48% decreased their work. I guess they weren't as professional, right, as, a, as, as we might want them to be because when they experienced a toxic exchange, their 48% admitted that they decreased their work effort. 47% uh, decreased their time at work, increased absenteeism. Oh, here's a question for you. If you got a bad boss, do you think you drink more or less? Do you think there's more or less inclination for domestic violence when you're working for a bad boss? It, it's, it's, a, it's a, at face value, we haven't done the research on that aspect of it, but I would tend to agree with, with you on that one probably. Uh, but somebody's looking for a dissertation, there's a topic for you. 80% um, lost time warning. Now, I don't care where you come down on that. Maybe those numbers aren't even exactly accurate. But if you're an enterprise leader of any organization, these kind of numbers will get your attention. And the idea is that there is, in fact, a price to be paid in terms of productivity indicators in organizations where they have bad leadership. And what about stress? We know that the physiological impact of chronic high levels of stress have physiological implications. Some of those are listed. Um, and I know some of you are thinking to yourselves, I eat stress for breakfast. I mean, stress motivates me. And that's true. I mean, stress can be motivating and it can also be debilitating. It, it can depends on how people handle it. We call that resilience. So it's, it's a mixed bag. But if this is true, that all of those maladies are associated with high levels of stress, and I will tell you, stress when it comes from your boss is different than the stress of getting shot at or, or doing something difficult at, at high stakes because it's chronic and it's persistent, right? And that tends to be a little bit of a different cat when it comes to stress. Um, so when it comes to leaders and leadership, I worked for uh, or worked with a gentleman who used to be the CEO of the Center for Creative Leadership. He was also a, a three-star general, and he had a lot of data at his, at his disposal. And he once suggested to me that we ought to treat our organizations as big human batteries, which is to say that they only have so much energy and capacity in them to do work. It's finite. It's limited. And you can get up there and just spur people for short periods of time to do intense levels of work, but eventually there's all there is, and, and, you, and you will run out. So some leaders, merely by the way that they treat other people, this has nothing to do with competence, just how they interact with other people, add energy to the organization. They are uplifting and motivating. And then there are some people that are the contrary. And I suggest to you that many of our performance evaluation systems do not distinguish between the two. In other words, they're just as likely to move into key positions to promote, if you will, those who are destructive as those who are energizing. All right? Now, you can argue with me about that, but that's my sense. And some, some are so far off to the left of that chart that I showed you at the beginning that they have a detrimental impact on the organization. Work gets done in the organization not because of what they bring to the table, but in spite of their interaction. And that's the group that I'm most interested in. So this is my definition of toxic leadership. It's a three-part definition. There's two elements and one magnifying factor or intervening variable, if you will. The first definition, part of the definition is an apparent lack of regard for the welfare of subordinates. They don't care. They don't care. Uh, they care about themselves. They care about getting ahead. They care about getting the job done, if you will. But this is all task behavior and no relationship behavior. This is a firm grip on one end of that uh, famous dichotomy in leadership studies, task versus relationship behavior. So there's a lack of concern for the well-being of subordinates, and there's an interpersonal style, if you will, that drives down organizational climate. Okay, that's an impact sort of a definition. So how do you have a negative impact on the organization? You can be a bully boss, right, and, and, and treat people like a human blowtorch and yell and scream and lose your temper and have a negative impact on the organization. I also submit that you can be a weak, uninvolved, lackadaisical leader who allows problems to manifest without intervention and be just have just as much of a negative impact on the organization. Would you buy that? 
Okay, so I'm not just talking about the big personality, yelling, screaming kind of person. I'm also talking to the weak and timid, won't get involved when they should kind of, of leadership. So the, the, the defining variable, the defining part of the definition is the impact they have on the organization. And then finally, a conviction by subordinates that the person in authority is getting ahead at their expense. Now I will tell you, this makes it so much worse. So much worse. It's a magnifying factor. And it's also a dampening factor if that's not there. And I had to add this because of a person that I worked with, kind of for, uh, who was a human blowtorch. But it was also a large and lethargic organization that had a very critical function. And he acted like Tyrannosaurus Rex because he felt he had to in order to move the organization we understood that. We understood that he was never going to be promoted again. This was, was his last assignment, and we tended to forgive him a little bit because his motives were pure. On the other hand, a person engaging in the same behavior who was getting ahead at, at, at our expense got no truck for that, right? We don't like that. And I think we all have a pretty sensitive barometer about when we're being taken advantage of, right? And that makes it so much worse. Um, okay, I try not to use profanity in my presentations, but this is an adult, or, or, uh, adult uh, population except for the little one in the back, and he's too young to know. I put hands over his ears. Uh, and the author of a pretty darn good book called The No Asshole Rule is a guy by the name of Robert Sutton who taught at Stanford. Pretty prestigious university, so if he can use the word, I'm going to use the word. And 27 years as a soldier, I'm familiar with the baser notes of the human vocabulary. I try not to use them because it reflects a lack of vocabulary. But nonetheless, since he did it, I'm going to do it. So how do you know if you're working for an asshole is the operational question here. Two parts. Number one, does the target feel oppressed, humiliated, de-energized? I did not pay him to use that word, but he did. De-energized or belittled. Does the target feel worse about him or herself after the exchange? But that's only half of the definition. The other half is, does the person aim their venom at someone who is less powerful rather than more powerful? And now this is something that I've come to discover. Toxic leaders kiss up and kick down, right? They're very responsive to their supervisors. No job is too hard. No deadline is too fast. They, will, they are receptive and totally influenceable from the top down, but make the life of their subordinates a living hell. Make their subordinates miserable. And it's all about status and position and authority. Um, one of my favorite Beetle Bailey cartoons, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but Sarge is going to an advanced training course. I know the men are having a going away party. When's the party? As soon as he goes away. I have hosted those parties. I have arranged those parties. I know what that looks like. Where the celebration is the fact that there's light at the end of the tunnel, not what all the great things that we have accomplished together and are proud of. And it's kind of a shame. Um, Dwight David Eisenhower once said, if you don't lead by hitting people over the head, that's assault, not leadership. Um, now, let me just jump over here to this photograph because I think this helps explain the phenomenon a little bit. Um, I talk to people that are pretty senior in organizations. They've been around for a while. And when I talk about this subject, they will say, you know, George, it used to be really bad about 10, 15 years ago. Boy, there were a lot of toxic guys running around. But it's a whole lot better today. And I say, yeah, for you. Ask these guys what they think. Never confuse your position in the organization and what you see as reflecting the experience of people at different levels on the, of the organization because what you see depends upon where you sit. So a friend of mine explained it like this, back to the primate example. Monkeys in the trees of the rainforest, okay? Monkeys in the trees. Certain groups of monkeys, the high status monkeys will congregate on the top branches because that's where the fruit ripens the fastest and is the most available. So the high status monkeys go to the top branches and they relegate the low status monkeys to the lower branches. So if you're a high status monkey and you look down, what do you see? Bright and shining monkey faces beaming back at you in adoration. But if you're on a lower status monkey on the lower branches and you look up, what do you see? It's a different view. 
it's a different view. And it's problematic. So one of the problems with toxic leadership is that they don't look so bad from the top down because they're very responsive to their supervisors. They just look bad from the bottom up. And that helps explain why they're perpetuated in organizations. And in almost every tragic case, I, I categorize any number of them in the book, uh, some really horrific cases. And in every single case, the, the supervisor of the toxic leader will say, gee, I didn't think it was that bad. I didn't know it was that bad. Well, maybe we're not good at looking down into the organization. Maybe we think we're better at that than we are. Or maybe the toxics are really good at reputation management, at, at, at endearing themselves to their supervisors all while they're making their subordinates miserable. That's possible. Very important caveat here. Not all loud, big personality leaders are toxic. And just because your supervisor barks at you one day doesn't make them toxic either. Three-part definition, right? Apparent lack of regard and an interpersonal style that drives down organizational climate. All right? Sometimes, I, you know, I forgot every time I got chewed out and deserved it. I forgot it. I mean, because I deserved it. I remember very clearly the, the times I got dressed down when I didn't deserve it, right? And you know what I'm talking about. I see a lot of heads going uh, north and south on that one. But just because they're big personality and loud doesn't mean they're toxic. There's a place for just about every kind of leadership style. This goes to the idea of situational leadership, right? The appropriate action by the influencer, the leader, if you will, is the action that is appropriate for the needs of the subordinates and the demands of the situation. So if the building's on fire, I'm yelling and screaming, you're moving, everybody's happy, right? Because it's the appropriate behavior for a particular situation. And sometimes a well-acted fit by the boss could be extremely effective in moving an organization in a particular direction. It's just ineffective when it's used as the default setting. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so here are some partially rhetorical questions. In light of the number of people that raised their hands at the beginning of the presentation, are we creating toxic leaders? Is there, is there something that we're doing in our developmental processes or whatever that is feeding this problem? Do we tolerate them? My sense is there's a high level of tolerance for a wide range of human behaviors when it comes to putting people in charge. There's a wide tolerance. And I think the world might be just a slightly better place if that band of tolerance were somewhat shrunk. And we said, I'm sorry, this particular behavior is unacceptable for this organization because it's inconsistent with our underlying values. How many are toxic leaders are in your organization? It's absolutely an empirical question. You can ask this question and get an answer. You can get a count because there are reliable and valid scales to measure the extent of toxic leadership in an organization. Um, so maybe there's some problems. I tend to look, I'm an organizational person, okay? My default level of analysis is not at the individual level, it's at the organizational level. So for me, I consider this to be a pathology in organizations and therefore maybe we ought to think about some organizational solutions to the problem. So I think we're doing part of it right now. We're talking about toxic leadership. We've got We've got a construct, we've got a definition for the construct, and we can now talk about it. So you can go down the hallway and say, oh yeah, Joe's toxic, and you both know what you're talking about. Joe knows what you're talking about, right? And I think to some degree that's a, that's a beneficial process. Um, what if we develop and selected people, not just with an eye on are they effective, but also look at their interpersonal style as part of that process? I think it is a fundamental error in leadership when we select people to be leaders based upon their technical abilities. Their technical abilities. What is it about being the world's best accountant that portends any success whatsoever in leading a team of accountants? What is it about being a great teacher that portends any success whatsoever in being a great principal? Or a beat cop? You can be the best beat cop in the world and you promote him to sergeant and you lose a good beat cop and you get a lousy sergeant. I mean, every profession has this problem. It's, a, it's an archetype in our minds that says, 
if you're a really good welder, you're going to be a good supervisor of welders. No, because that's technical ability. And the higher you go in organizations, the less important technical ability it becomes. The more important interpersonal behavior comes. The more important cognitive types of uh, skills become. But we make that mistake all the time. Uh, let's go to, I love 360 degree feedback for developmental purposes. It can be done badly, but 360 degree feedback is when you evaluate yourself on a set of criteria, your supervisor, your peers, and your subordinates in the organization evaluate you along those same criteria. So you get a 360 degree view. And that's helpful because you can say, am I presenting myself significantly differently to my superiors than I am my subordinates? This will provide you data to see if that is the case. It can be very, very useful information, if done properly. And we can talk about in the Q&A about how to do that wrong, if you like. And I believe in having hard discussions. And I say it's a hard discussion because it's difficult to look people in the eye and tell them that they're not performing to standard. It's hard. I mean, let's admit it. As human beings, we just do not invite that kind of conflict. We take a deep breath. We have to steel ourselves to do it. Good supervisors will do it, and they can do it with compassion and with dispassion, if you like, but nonetheless, it's not an easy thing to do. And I added that to the presentation when I was talking to an engineering firm in Pennsylvania. It was a good company, it really was. And their senior leadership team was in the room, 20 some odd people, all their senior vice presidents. And they had done really well. And I'm talking about this subject, and unlike you, who were all attentive, who were all looking forward, very quiet, and it, engaged in the presentation, there was something going on in that room. They were elbowing each other. They were kicking each other under the table. They were passing notes. There was a murmur that arose in the room to the point I said, I think I should stop. I think I've lost you. Maybe I've said something to offend you. If so, I apologize. But I think I am done because I think you and I are in very different places right now. And the CEO raised his hand. He said, no, George, that's not it. That's not it. He said, you're getting this reaction in the room right now because there are two toxic leaders in this room. They know who they are. Everybody else in this room knows who they are, and we have put up with it for far too long. He said, I think we're about to have a hard discussion. Would you mind stepping out in the hallway for about 15 minutes while we roll our sleeves up and go to work? Okay. I walked out and I paced up and down the hallway and I said, this is the worst presentation ever. This is horrible. I don't know what's going on in the room. In the army, it would be a blanket party. I mean, you throw a blanket over them, you beat on them and all that. I don't want to be responsible for that. I, I, I don't know what's going on in that room, but it's nothing I had planned and I'm, I'm just beating myself up about it. And then I stopped and I started to think and I said, you know what he just tell me? He just said that this is a problem They've been putting up with it for far too long, and now they have permission to do something about it, and they're doing the work. I said, you know, if you think about it, that's pretty good. So before long, I talked myself out of being the worst presentation in the world to being the best presentation in the world. I gave myself a big booyah. Yeah, this is good. This is great, which shows you the power of human delusion. That's what it does. We delude ourselves. But we have to have more hard discussions about that. Um, and I'd like to tell you a story about a friend of mine, a hypothetical guy by the name of Harry, whose real name was Harry. And Harry was put in charge of an organization that was a critical function, and it was broken. It was broken. It was a bad team. Work wasn't getting done, and it was a real problem. So Harry's boss told him, I don't care what you do, but you've got to get this team from noncompliance to compliance. So in Harry's words, he became Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, he got the nickname of the Zapper because he fired so many people. Zap, you're fired. Zap, pack up your desk. Zap, get out of my sight. I mean, he was, he, he led by fear. Admittedly, he led by fear. And you know what? He had an impact on the organization. It went from non-compliant to compliant. And his boss, after about nine months, and this is where I give real credit to the boss. The boss called Harry in after about nine months and said, now what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? And Harry said, I was doing it. He said, no, no, you've, you've, you've done what I asked you to do. You took a dysfunctional team, you, you washed out all the dead weight, and that was, that was progress, and, you, and you've got them doing what you want them to do because they're afraid to do anything else. 
you've come this far. But here's the problem. I need you to go from compliance to commitment. I, I need you to take this team from just doing what it is that you do because they're afraid of you to doing what needs to be done even if you're not there. And you cannot do that with your current leadership style. You cannot get there from here. Harry said, I don't understand. He said, well, let me put it to you this way. I can fire the manager or I can fire the team. This team's too good to fire. That leaves you. He goes, I understand. I understand. And here's, here's what the boss said, which I think was brilliant. He said, now you're going to change your behavior, but here's what you need to do. You need to get all your people together. You need to explain to them what you're doing and why. Because otherwise, they're going to think you're schizophrenic. Because you are going to change your behavior, right? Or you will not be successful here. Harry said, I understood. He changed his behavior. He was outrageously successful, not only in that assignment, but in follow-on assignments as well. And I give all of the credit to the supervisor because remember, the toxic leaders are influenceable from the top down. They just don't listen to subordinates. They will not take feedback from subordinates, but they will take it from their boss. That's the opportunity. So up to this point in the presentation, you've probably been thinking about the relationship that you've had with your supervisors, right? I want you to stop that. I want you to take a deep breath and let it go because there's nothing you can do about that. But what you can influence are the behavior of your subordinates. And if they have toxic tendencies, you can influence that. You can tell them in no, certain, un, no uncertain terms, and I really think that's the right way to have the discussion. This kind of behavior will not be successful here because it's inconsistent with our underlying values. And if they continue to persist in the negative behaviors, they're gone, right? They're gone. You don't, you don't need it. I don't care how technically competent they are. Uh, that's part of the no asshole rule. And I was doing a faculty hire at my last institution, and I said, we're going to implement the no asshole rule, right? No matter how brilliant they are, if they're a jerk, we don't want them, right? And I had a faculty member that argued with me about that. And he said, he was a very senior faculty member, very influential. And he said, now, wait a minute. He said, we're an academic institution. What if they write really great books? Now, maybe not as good as Tarnish, but what if they write really, <laughs> what if they write really great books? What if they're magnificent researchers? What if they pull in all sorts of grant money? Don't we want to be an institution where we can find a place for that? And I thought for about a half second, I said, oh, hell no. <laughs> We've got to live with them 10 years for life, dude. You know, if they, if they don't have the interpersonal dispositions to, to be a part of our organization, they can't treat people right, I want, I want no part of them. I don't care how brilliant they are. We argued about that. We argued about that. But a majority of the committee felt the way I did. So we hired no assholes. Um, and I think this is one that, organizationally speaking, we attack from the top down. Why? Because if you have a toxic junior executive in your organization, it's problematic. But if you have a toxic CEO, it's a tragedy because of the amount of wake that these people cast behind them. And not only that, but the example that they set, when you take someone who is toxic and you put them in a position of great responsibility, that is a signal to other people in the organization about the kind of behavior that the organization views as successful. And that just perpetuates the problem. And here's another little, little trick. We have understood for some time since we've been doing research on personnel evaluations that we in, subtly, there's a subtle bias. We tend to evaluate higher those who are like us. If you see yourself in a subordinate, you're likely to rate them higher than someone who strikes you as fundamentally different. Now you can think about the implications of that for race and gender and so forth. But also think about it just in terms of personality type and leadership style. Okay, so if you're in a position of responsibility and authority, and you have a group of subordinates and someone leads like you, you're going to evaluate them lower? No, you see yourself in them, you're going to evaluate them higher. And I had a boss of mine one time who was the world's greatest uh, butt chewer in the world. He was. He was awesome at it. He could... He could reduce human beings to quivering piles of jelly if they had engaged in some sort of misconduct or substandard performance in a way that, quite frankly, I saw as artful. He was amazing. He was a surgeon with his words. And he would try to teach that to me. And I couldn't do it. It was not my style. He would get in there and he'd get on a roll. And 
and I would just, my mouth, I, it was amazing. He would call me in. He'd say, okay, I'm going to give punishment at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So-and-so screwed up. I'm going to call him in. You're going to stand over the room. You're going to watch me do this. And he would, and I would be in awe because he was masterful at it. I could never do it. If I tried, I'd burst out laughing. But I had a guy who was not a good soldier. He was a horrible soldier. He gave us nothing but trouble from the day he came into the organization. And eventually we had to fire him. Yes, you can be fired from the Army. Believe it or not, you can be. And, and we chaptered him out. We said, your services are no longer required. And uh, there's a lot of paperwork, so it's a hard thing to do. But nonetheless, we did that. And he came into my office. He was going to have the last discussion with me that he was ever going to have in uniform. And as soon as I finished with him, he was going to go process out, get on a bus, and go back to wherever the hell he came from. So he comes in and sits down. And I, I kind of wanted to yell at him because he'd been nothing but a pain in my side ever since I first met him. But I couldn't do it. It wasn't my style. So I just started talking to him about how disappointed I was. How disappointed I was not just in him, but also in his non-commissioned officers and in myself. I was personally disappointed that I was unable to influence him from sub-marginal to marginal behavior. I felt bad about that. I did. And I also felt bad that he wasn't going to be able to continue to do this thing that I truly felt was a noble thing. And I don't remember the words I said, but partway into this discussion, a tear started to well up in the corner of his eye. And I thought, my God, I'm getting through. For the first time ever, there's some sort of a, a, of a connection here that has, and I kept talking. And before long, the tears were flowing. And then he was sobbing. And I got to tell you the truth. I was a little choked up myself. Okay. So finally, there's nothing more to say. I get up. I shake his hand. I thank him for his limited substandard service. I open the door. I escort him out. As he walks out, my commander walked in, sees him all sobbed up, you know, walked out the door. And he sticks his head in my office and he goes, now that's how you chew ass. Style. It's all about style. It's all about style. All right. Uh, so here's a problem. All right. Typically, we look at this, this axis right here. Are we getting good results or are we not getting good results, right? That's what matters. Getting the job done or not getting the job done. If you don't get the job done, we deal with that. If, you, if you're getting the job done, that's all that cares. But I think that second matrix is also important. That second dichotomy up there, you have, if they're have positive leader behaviors and negative leader behaviors, which creates four possibilities. One, they're leading well and they're getting the job done. Big green smiley face, right? That's the quadrant that we want everybody to be operating in, but there's three other quadrants as well. This one we've always done a pretty good job of dealing with. These two are the problem. So this matrix over here, this uh, quadrant, is when they're leading well, their influence behaviors are appropriate and consistent with the underlying values of the organization. They're just not getting the job done. So I would submit that the appropriate approach for that is you invest in those people. You've, you, they're typically not getting the job done because they lack something that they need, a resource perhaps, or understanding or knowledge, or maybe they need additional development or whatever. But they've got the stuff, they're just not getting it done. They, they are, that's where we need to put our attention. And then we have, unfortunately, this quadrant down here, which is okay in many organizations, that you're getting the job done, but you're getting it done in a way that's not appropriate. You're not treating people as consistent with long-term health and welfare. That is problematic. So the way you have this discussion with a group of people is, those of you who are here, good on you. Those of you who are here, help is coming. Those of you who are down here, get on the bus or get off the bus, or I'll throw you under the bus, okay? There's a lot of people that, are, that can get good results who can lead well. I don't need people who are getting, good, getting results who are leading badly.